Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe. In your Son, Emmanuel, you have shown us your light and saved us from the power of sin. Bless us as we light the candles on this wreath. Increase our longing for your presence, that at the celebration of your son's birth, his spirit might dwell anew in our midst. For he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. A few announcements this morning uh, for uh, greetings, favored ones. Uh, today, you will hear a little bit about, well, an angel appearing to Mary uh, and addressing her with this strange greeting. Greetings, favored ones. Uh, a couple of announcements. Our Christmas Eve service is at 5 o'clock. Uh, we've asked that people pre-register for it, uh, and they have, and it is full. Uh, but our 7 o'clock service still has some openings, and I'm quite certain that our 9 a.m. Christmas Day service will have a lot of room. So you don't have to register for that one. Just come and join us Christmas morning. Uh, with that, uh, let us begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our entrance hymn, sung by our cantor, is from the Lutheran Book of Worship, page 33, The King Shall Come. <laughs> Oh, 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord God, Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the hindrance of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Well, I noticed that we just have one family again, so uh, I'm going to invite you two to come up uh, Jeff, would you be so kind as to grab the candy basket for us again, as you so kindly did last week, because I did not grab it. So if you guys want to come up for a children's sermon, that would be great. And we'll have you just sit, like, over here, right? If you guys want to sit, like, right there or so, right? We don't want to get too close with the virus going around. But I've got a children's sermon for you. So, hello, children of God. Oh, looks like we've got another child here, too. Do you want to just sit, like, over here? You, you guys are in school. You know how to social distance, right? Yep, you know how to do that. So, uh, one of the most exciting times in a couple's life together is when they find out they're going to have a baby, right? They get really excited about this, and they have to prepare. There's a lot of things that they need to do when they're having the baby. And one of the important things that they have to do is pick out a name, right? They won't actually let you go home from the hospital until you've picked out a name. So you've got to have one ready to fill out the birth certificate before you can even go home. Now, parents choose their kids' names really carefully because the, you're going to have it your whole life, right? You're going to have your name your whole life. Your last name might change, but you're going to have your first name for your whole life. And so sometimes couples, uh, they'll get a book. They'll buy one or they'll take one out from the library like I did. Or they can look online and they can find names and they can find out what those names mean, uh, and they can choose a name, maybe, that has a special meaning. Now, do you guys know what your names mean? You know what your names mean? Well, guess what? I looked them up, so I can tell you. I looked them up in this book. Lydia, your name means uh, that you're from the ancient kingdom of Lydios in Asia Minor, and it was a place of great culture. And uh, William, you know what your name means? It means strong-willed warrior. All right? 
Uh, and Jonah, do you know what your name means? It means dove, which is a sign of peace, right? Now, uh, when, pe- when the couple's child is born, they'll often put the child's name on a birth announcement. I just happen to have one here that I created for my grandson, Azrael, and his name means my help is God, right? He's pretty cute, isn't he? Yeah, cute. Oh, do you know what? I've got June's name, too. Her name means she was born in the month of June, which is named after the Roman goddess Juno, who protected children and marriage. Now, when Mary and Joseph found out they were having a baby, things didn't happen like that, right? They didn't get a book to find out the baby's name, to choose a name for the baby. Uh, In fact, they didn't even get to choose the baby's name at all. Instead, we learn in the gospel message that God sent them a type of birth certificate, but not a piece of paper. He sent them the angel Gabriel to tell them that Mary was going to have a son. And she was going to name him Jesus. Now, do you know what Jesus means? What the name Jesus means? It means uh, the Lord saves. That's what his name means. Jesus means the Lord saves. It's a pretty good name, isn't it? Right? Uh, On Christmas Eve, we're going to hear that an angel appeared to Joseph, too, and said that they should name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins, right? This is what his name means. And Jesus' name is really important because in Acts 4, 12, we read that there's only one name that can save us from our sins. And do you know what that name is? Jesus. Jesus. That's the only name that can save us from our sins. Now, Jesus was born in a manger so that he could come and save you from your sins. Now, do you remember how it is that Jesus saves us from our sins? What does he do that saves us? Do you remember? Yeah. He dies on the cross for us, doesn't he? And because he dies on the cross, well, he did it because he loves you so much. And through his death, he says, I forgive you all your sins. God says, I'm not going to remember the bad things that you've done. I'm just going to remember that I love you and that you belong to me. And so when we celebrate the baby Jesus coming at Christmas, we're celebrating that he came to rescue us, to save us from our sins, right? So you guys can remember that on Christmas, that that's why we have Christmas. Would you guys pray with me? Can we uh, fold our hands and bow our heads? And you can repeat after me, and the congregation can too. Dear God, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as we celebrate his birth. Help us to remember that Jesus came to save us. Thank you for loving us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I am going to put a little hand sanitizer on here and give you guys a treat, all right? You can go back with your parents and you can have a treat. Come on and grab one. Uh, Would you like a Skittles or would you like a Sour Punch? Skittles, there you go. How about you? Skittles or a Sour Punch? All right.
The first lesson is from the second chapter of Samuel, or I'm sorry, the seventh chapter of 2 Samuel. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, see now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel." and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Here ends the reading. Let us read responsively Psalm 89. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your faithful love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, and to your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. The second lesson is from the 16th chapter of Romans. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Here ends the reading. Alleluia. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? 
The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be, be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Greetings, favored ones. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there are three, at least three, miracles in our gospel reading today. First, that God and man should be joined together in this child. The Word becomes flesh. God is incarnate and becomes one of us. Second, that a mother could remain a virgin. She would conceive without a man. And third, that Mary should have such faith as to believe that the fulfillment of God's promise would be accomplished in her. That is, in her womb, prophecy would be carried out. So let's delve into these great miracles. Now, Mary you may know, was likely somewhere between 12 and a half and 15 years old. She was engaged, or a better word would be betrothed to Joseph, but they weren't officially married. A contract had been signed uh, between both families of the bride-to-be and the groom, to be, uh, and a divorce would actually be necessary in order to break the betrothal. Uh, and the time of the betrothal would generally be at least nine months. Guess why? Well, to ensure that she wasn't already pregnant, right? Uh, and uh, so here's Mary in the midst of her betrothal, and suddenly the angel Gabriel appears before her. Now this greeting, greetings, he says, greetings favored one, the greeting that Gabriel exclaims comes from the Greek word charis. That's the root word of it. And it has the meaning of rejoice for you are favored. It's kind of like uh, the beginning of the sermon when I start out, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, that's the type of greeting. This is what he was saying to her. And then it, calling her favored one means she's a recipient of God's grace, God's good pleasure, right? His good will rests upon her. God is pleased with her. She is chosen, favored, a favorite of God. So Mary hears this, and it says she's perplexed by this. She's perplexed by what the angel said. And by perplexed, it means she's deeply troubled. She is mentally disturbed or confused, right? In her mind, she's confused about what he's saying. And when it says pondered, it means that she's actually debating, arguing with herself in an internal dialogue. You know what this is like, right? You, you're debating something. Should I do this? Should I not? What's going on here? This is what's happening with Mary. You see, Mary considers herself a lowly handmaiden, right? She's not great. She's not rich. She's not wealthy. Uh, but she was raised in a culture that believed that it was the rich who were favored by God, that how much you had would show how much God favors you. 
And so what she started to do when she heard these words from the angel is she looked inward to test for herself this word spoken by the angel, right? She went through her catalog of memories, sifting through the events of her life to determine if this greeting rings true. Am I favored by God? Is the Lord really with me? Now, we do this too, don't we? We hear a promise that we have God's good pleasure and that his grace rests on us. And then we start to look inwardly, right, in our minds to determine if it's true. We think about the events in our lives and we weigh them out, right? We replay the recordings in our, uh, of our life. Uh, And we try to determine if there's more blessing or cursing going on, right? What's happening in our lives? And when we're in the midst of suffering, well, then we certainly don't believe that God is gracing us, right? That he's blessing us, that his good favor rests upon us, but more that he's cursing or punishing us. Or at the very least, we might believe that God is indifferent to the pain we experience. We may also look through the events of our lives and say, nope, that promise can't possibly be for me because I don't deserve it. I have been too disobedient, too rebellious, too wayward. I'm too broken, and I break everything that I touch. I ruin it all. Then, when we hear the Lord is with you, We might feel inclined to respond as Peter did when he first met Jesus. Go away from me, for I am a sinful man. Now the angel Gabriel reads Mary's mind, right? He knows what's going on. He's been sent to her with a specific word. He can see the wheels spinning in her head, and perhaps she's got a troubled look on her face. So he reassures her. Do not be afraid, Mary. Now, the angels always seem to say that when they appear, right? Which tells us that apparently angels aren't like the cute little precious moments, figurines that we have on a shelf, right? Uh, But they strike fear in the heart when these heavenly beings suddenly appear and start speaking to us. Well, the angel continues again. He says, you have found favor with God. He's driving that home. She has a favor that she didn't have to work for, but God's grace has fallen into her lap. God's chosen her just because it pleased him to do so. Not because of how good Mary was, but because of how good our God is. Then, Gabriel announces an amazing miracle. You're going to have a baby, Mary, and you're going to name him Jesus. His name, Jesus, tells us of God's gracious plan. It means God is salvation. The Lord saves. Her child will save his people from their sins. The Messiah that you're waiting for, Mary, he's going to grow in your blessed womb for nine months. You will carry the whole treasure of God's grace in your womb. And he will be the son of the Most High God. And God's promise to David, as we read in our first lesson, is fulfilled as Mary and Joseph are both from the line of David. Her son, therefore, will also be the son of man, son of God, son of man. The two natures, divine and human, will be joined as the word becomes flesh. Our second miracle, or our, uh, a miracle. 
Uh, Mary responds then, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Now, her question isn't one of disbelief, but of biology, right? She's not married. She doesn't know a man, but she does know a little bit about the birds and the bees. Outside of marriage, the pregnancy would be assumed to be adultery, causing shame and dishonor on her and her family and Joseph. Therefore, it would be considered unholy and outside of God's law. And as we know, stoning was the punishment for adultery. So we can imagine she'd be curious how this is going to happen. Now, in answering her, Gabriel quells her fears, saying that the Holy Spirit will do this. God will overshadow her. This pregnancy, therefore, will be holy. This baby will be holy. How holy? Well, Son of God holy, pure, righteous, divine, hallowed, a holy miracle, pregnant, but still a virgin. Then, to give further reassurance, he tells her about her relative Elizabeth. Now, Gabriel had also appeared to Zechariah, who was a priest, while he was in the temple, uh, carrying out his duties, and he was Elizabeth's husband. And so Gabriel informed him that his long, barren wife, right, menopause had long come and gone, she was going to have a child. Though, of course, he didn't believe it, and he was struck dumb. The priest was struck dumb. Now, as Mary hears of this miracle that happens to her relative, it further reassures her of God's power, right? As the angel says, for nothing is impossible with God. Two conception miracles. And so having heard the promise of God, what is Mary's response? Here I am, the servant, actually the slave of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Faith has been created within Mary through the power of God's word, through these great promises. And so how can this be becomes Let it be by faith in God's promise, and we have our third miracle. Well, God sends you a messenger today, though not an angel, with this message. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. God took on flesh, becoming one of us, in order to save us, you and I, from our sins by his death on the cross. And first, in baptism, and then the Lord keeps choosing you again and again through his forgiveness and the Lord's Supper. And God's favor, and in fact, his Son, are handed over to you in this word of Christ, I forgive you. By that word, the Lord has chosen you. You are God's favorite, chosen, beloved, and the whole treasure of God's grace is yours. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen.
Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Most High, you have favored us in the incarnation of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, Son of Mary. In everything, let it be to us according to your word. Give us faith to believe that nothing is impossible with you, and so to pray boldly in childlike confidence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Most High, you have revealed in Christ Jesus the mystery kept secret for long ages, now made known to all nations through the prophetic and apostolic scriptures. According to your eternal command, give us faithful preachers of your gospel to create steadfast faith through the power of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen your holy church in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Most High, hear our prayers on behalf of our nation, its presidents, all legislators and judges, those newly elected to serve, and our military, especially Tabor Gluth, Emily Went, and Joseph Went. Preserve their lives and guide their actions for the good of our people. Give peace among the nations of the earth and preserve us from pestilence and famine, war and bloodshed, sedition, rebellion, and every evil. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Most High, grant all women with children and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings. Look with compassion on the lonely, the depressed, and the despairing. Grant healing to the sick and give peace to the anxious and dying. Especially today, we lift up those who have asked for our prayers Alice Trebish, and we also pray for all who have the coronavirus. Comfort all who mourn, especially the family of Norman Krebs, with the certain hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Most High, we give you thanks for your Son, our dear Lord Jesus, who is the key of David and the scepter of the house of Israel. By his death, he has opened the kingdom of heaven and closed the gates of hell for all who trust in him. By his resurrection, he has rescued the prisoners who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Grant that as we recall with thanksgiving his advent in the flesh, we may always confess him and remain watchful for his advent in glory at the last day. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Our closing hymn from the Lutheran Book of Worship, page 35, is Hark the Glad Sound. <laughs> 